global procurement summit procurement adjusting to new realities automation ai and ml let's welcome on the digital dais the session chair mr rajiv kanpal chief financial officer government e marketplace gem india good afternoon sir we good welcome afternoon. mr mayank rotra thank you welcome sir we invite mr ank mehrotra director deloitte india consulting india good afternoon everyone pleasure to be here good afternoon mr mehrotra now i invite ms eliza nevia domska senior counsel public procurement european bank for restructuring and development ms eliza we also welcome on the digital dais mr ashutosh datta senior scientist and 5g chief strategist hopkins university applied physics laboratories usa hello good afternoon everybody good with this i here. hand over the session with this i hand over the session to dr rajiv kantpal the chairperson of the session over to you sir thank you good afternoon it is a privilege for me to welcome the audience to this panel discussion on how procurement is adjusting to new the new realities of automation ai ml supply chain management localized sourcing etc ladies and gentlemen artificial intelligence is one of the hottest topics today in technology and it is transforming procurement in a big way it is automatic meeting or improving many time consuming tasks and giving procurement experts additional insights on the other hand it is also allowing buying organizations to solve complex problems related to say from spend analysis to contract management to strategic sourcing etc similarly related technologies like machine learning natural language processing and robotic process automation are also providing for algorithm algorithms that predict interpret and mimic human actions and thus they reduce the repetitive and simple kind of tasks with this illustrious panel that we have today i we will be discussing all these and related issues uh, i welcome all the eminent speakers to this discussion and to set the ball rolling i would like to begin with sharing my own experience at gem and as to how gem has leveraged technology to transform the public procurement scenario in the country i'll just like to share a, a powerpoint just let me know if it's visible just hold on please so is my slide visible yes yes mr kanpal thank you so much thanks so this is uh, uh, in the next 10 minutes i'm going to briefly talk about how gem has leveraged technology to transform the public procurement scenario in the country just a brief background about gem gem or government e marketplace is a one stop online procurement portal for all government buyers and it was established in august 2016 so the objective so to say was to set up a cashless contactless and a paperless digital marketplace from where all the government agencies could buy so it was essentially the ob basic objective was to was to curb the so called maladies in the public pro procurement system such as lack of transparency lack of fairness in evaluation corruption issues etc and setting up of gem required a lot of reorientation in terms of the administrative fair framework in terms of the processes that were standard operating processes that were applicable and in terms of the capacity building so presently government all government organizations autonomous bodies funded by the government are mandated to compulsorily source their procurement needs from government e marketplace and the overarching legislation so to say for this comes from the general financial rules the rule 149 says that all procurement of goods and services uh, by ministry or department yeah yeah sorry kanpal sorry to interrupt sir we just request you to put your ppt on the full screen mode please so that it is it, clear it is already it is already in full screen mode should i try it again yes yeah, sir if you can please let, let me just see let me just see we can still see your uh, you know the left panel uh 
the uh, the slide board let sir? me let me just no i it is it is full blown slides but i think i will just stop sharing and come back again just hold on sure please. sir if you wish we can put it up from here no it's okay i think i'll be able to do it let me just okay fine if in case if you need done. help then we can do that does this work does this work uh yeah it is yes. perfectly fine absolutely thank you thank you thank so much please years. carry on yeah thank you. yeah yeah <laughs> thank you so much for that feedback so i as i was talking this is basically the general financial rules mandate all government bodies to so compulsorily source their needs procurement issues through jeb this has been the rough this, the summary of our journey so far four and a half years of existence and today Uh, Gem is a marketplace, perhaps the biggest marketplace, digital marketplace in the country, which has about fifty thousand buyer organizations, about eighty four lakh, eighty four thousand crore of transaction gross merchandise value of goods and services sold on Gem so far, and about ten point five lakh sellers are there at the marketplace. So the numbers speak for themselves. in this is in this presentation i would like to just focus on how technology has been used by gem to bring about benefits and what have these been what are these benefits if any which have accrued to the government as a buyer on the gem platform a number of awards also as a path breaking innovation gem has been receiving from national and international bodies i think i'll skip this one so i would like to basically talk about three attributes here with which the three benefits which are brought to gem as a means of leveraging technology first i would like to speak about transparency so you see this is the a kind of a framework which provides the public proc procurement framework in the country so just i put this slide here just to bring drive home the fact that there are presently so many regulators so many administrative guidelines and also a lot of legislative provisions which have to be observed by any public procurement body when it enters into public procurement so this multiplicity of so many guidelines circulars orders regulators makes it a very complicated process to process a public tender in the country and this is exactly where gem steps in you see the challenge is with such myriad guidelines the challenge for a public tender giving body is to ensure synchronous implementation of various orders and guidelines there are so many rules under the gfr there has the preference to make in india rule there is the pr procurement policy for mscs and done if it is done manually it is so much of a tedious work i would not say it is impossible but very very difficult to ensure that all these rules get followed synchronously in a tender and this is exactly where uh, gem has been able to develop algorithms through through artificial intelligence machine learning where in all these all these myriad set of guidelines can be followed they can be synchronously processed to arrive at an outcome so this is where and there are so many exemptions also which have been given to various kind of seller groups like say mscs or startups and these exemptions earlier when they were processed manually there were cases of being fake certificates being submitted so gem has put in place a com a complex api based verification mechanism with various government bodies wherein these can be digitally certified to be true so to sum up on the ask on the key metrics of transparency there have been immense benefits i would just like to show here today the average bid participation rate on gem as a public procurement platform is 9.5 so in for each bid that is invited on the platform the average number of bidders expected is 9.5 which is about 2.5 times the earlier erstwhile system of dgsnd which we used to have as far as the seller participation we have about 50 times more i just told you that there are about 10.5 lakh sellers on the platform and the product categories i think it is gone up by 8 times to 10 times of the earlier uh, when we have used to had the man manual categories so this is about transparency let's now look at the speed the efficiency with what technology has introduced to the system 
I think uh, my slides are fairly visible to all. So I will be I, I will be speaking about efficiency of procurement. So these are just a few key metrics I tried to capture here. Uh, it, earlier in the manual system, any government organization, when it used to do a tender, it would framing of drafting of the RFP, then approval of the RFP, publishing the request for proposal would take something like four to six months. Today, it can be done in one day flat on the government e-marketplace platform. So I would say one up to one by 180 times we have been able to reduce this, this processing time. And the registration and offering on the portal happens today. Any seller who wishes to register and onboard his product can do it in maximum four days. And earlier in the DGSND time, it used to take something like four months. If we look at the efficiency of cost, that is savings. We recently had a very, uh, a very intense study which was done by World Bank and which says that GEM, as compared to the other public procurement portals, offers at least a 9.75% savings. Uh, if we look at the on the basis of the median price bid, Ap this is apart from the ERP because of the integration of ERP mechanisms of GEM with all other buyer organizations, a lot of printing and paper cost, advertising cost, the, all these are saved. So these, these are the metrics on efficiency. I would also like to show the third, but something which is very often missed in public procurement, which is the factor of equity. GEM, when it was established, it was a key mandate given to GEM was that it will provide for special provisions for the niche seller segment. So to say, like say the MSEs, or the startups or the women entrepreneurs, artisans, weavers, which otherwise would have a lot of lot of issues, a lot of which would face a lot of challenges and bottlenecks if they were if and when they wanted to sell to government agencies. And in this context, GEM has especially made sure that we have dedicated pages, we have a dedicated a microsite within the uh, GEM platform wherein we can we cater to these. Uh, smaller but very important segments. So we have something like 5 lakh MSMEs on the platform today, 8,000 plus startups on the platform today, women, 83,000 women entrepreneurs sell their products on the platform today, and 1 lakh 75,000 artisans and weavers. And there are so many other, I'm just other categories like, like say tribal handicrafts, like say emporium products, which are all niche seller segments. So if you look at it, almost out of the 84,000 crore GMV that GEM has registered clocked so far, almost 50% of it has come from sales arising out of these such smaller seller segments, which uh, is a huge kind of a service which has been given to MSMEs, startups, women entrepreneurs, because the feedback which was coming was that they, they had a lot of problems, a lot of bottlenecks, a lot of pitfalls when they tried to sell to government agencies. I think this, this was briefly, I want, what I wanted to capture was this is how technology uh, has helped us, A, in transforming the public procurement system and B, in streamlining it in the sense that uh, the typical ma earlier maladies which used to prevail in a in a public procurement scenario of say lack of transparency, lack of fairness, corruption issues, they have been taken out. Thirdly and more importantly is also that the, the, pain, the, pro, the pain points associated with public procurement which the government agencies earlier used to handle, that is now completely done away with or at least quite, quite significantly mitigated because of the algorithms because of the rule bidding modules, the processes that we've been able to develop in GEM. I think with that, I will just stop sh uh, sharing this slide and uh, maybe uh, we can have a discussion on this. There may be questions, I'm sure, but we can always have a discussion on that later. Uh, I am uh, So with that, I, could, uh, I would like to now invite my colleague, Mr. Uh, Ashutosh Datta, who would like to offer his comments, please, and who would like to share his insights? Over to you. Okay, can you hear me, Dr. Tanpal? Hello? Can yeah, you hear we me? can hear you loud okay. and clear. 
Thank okay, you. excellent. Uh, so you want me to present, uh, give my presentation, right? As you feel appropriate, it's up entirely up to you. Okay. Uh, no, I will uh, give my presentation. Uh, maybe we can have a discussion later on. Uh, so my present, let me see if I can share my screen one second. First of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm here in Maryland, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. So it's about 5.48 a.m. right now here. Yeah. Okay, let's see. All right. Uh, I will uh, give a specific uh, use case. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, so I, uh, I, I work for Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. I also sabbatical fellow at Johns Hopkins. Uh, uh, I do co-chair IEEE Future Network Initiative, which is uh, um, looking towards three-year, five-year, and 10-year roadmap. Uh, so today, my talk would be focused on uh, 5G networks and what are the supply chain security issues there. Uh, with, with my hat as IEEE co-chair, I had also visited uh, uh, countries in Europe, like Germany, Netherlands, um, Turkey, uh, at the invitation of the United States uh, government to talk about several security issues uh, uh, within 5G, right? So I'll try to focus that because now uh, many parts of the world uh, operators are deploying 5G networks and why and how the operators should be concerned about what are the potential security issues. So that's I'm going to focus because this will be a good use case to see uh, how we can apply some of the best current practice while procuring uh, different aspects of 5G networks. In the past, I used to work for AT&T, one of the largest operator uh, within the United States. So I had some exposure in terms of how to deploy uh, the actual network end to end, right? So that will be focus of my talk. Uh, so with that, we can have an interesting discussion later on. So with that, uh, let me, um, I know some of you may or may not know about 5G networks. I'll give a little bit introduction about 5G networks. Then I'll go dive, deep dive into some of the security issues. Then I'll see what are the supply chain related stuff that are important. And then we'll see how some of the techniques like AI, ML we have uh, can use that and use some kind of a closed loop automation to detect and mitigate some of the security issues, right? So that's how my talk is uh, uh, organized. Uh, so what is 5G communication all about, right? Um, so this is uh, going to really affect um, our uh, community in many ways. Uh, you have intelligent transportation system, e-health, robotics at home, uh, water quality, smart wearables. And if you look at it, uh, some of them need high bandwidth. Some of them need uh, uh, low, ultra low latency, like remote surgery type. And some of them have lots of lots of massive sensing type uh, devices. So in order to support that, you need a network end-to-end -end that is flexible, resilient. Uh, at the same time, if there is an attack happening, how quickly you can detect and mitigate, right? So that means uh, important part is when you are putting the software or hardware, any part of the network, we need to make sure uh, those are secure enough, right? Uh, if they, are, they have their own traps, they can uh, do bad things, that's not a good thing, right? So we need to make sure we have a process in place uh, before they are deployed, even after they're deployed, when the patching happening or new software coming up, uh, they are protected, right? Our infrastructure is pr protected. So I'll focus on that. So with that, what is happening in the 5G world, right? So 3GPP, uh, which is third generation partnership program within uh, Etsy, uh, is developing uh, the architecture, right? We had 4G, now we are getting into 5G. And thing on the right hand side you see from ITU, they develop different KPIs. So depending on which application you are uh, deploying, you have a data rate, spectrum efficiency, mobility, et cetera. So they come up with a requirement and pass it on to 3GPP. And you see on the left-hand side, and there are different types of application. There are three types, enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency, massive machine to machine type communication, right? So these are the three broad categories of application. And within the triangle, you can see, depending on where you're applying, is it, uh, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, or self-driving car, industrial automation. So you start with an application, come up with the key performance indicators, then map it to the architecture. And then you see what are the security issues there, right? 
Um, so that's kind of a high level view. Now let me, uh, okay, so they, and they're developing in phase wise, phase one, phase two, depending on um, where the standard is, the operators are deploying the 5G networks around the world, right? Right now, you know, they're doing in the phase one at some point within the next two to three years, they'll be deploying all of those. So with that, so let me show you how a network actually looks like. So this is a typical um, high level view of network. And I'm showing this because it is so important sometimes when I've been visiting <laughs> Um, European countries, uh, and I was talking to the embassy guys, and they, 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 they called many operators. Sometimes they thought, well, you know, um, the, the threat is actually in the core. It is not in the RAN on a radio access network. It's not in the edge cloud, right? So that is kind of a misnomer. So it is so important to understand the potential threats that is coming from an end-to-end -end network. So if you have, if you see, like we all have our cell phones, and this is our end devices, then you have over the air, these are all the cell towers with uh, 5G. There's going to be lots of lots of cell towers because they'll be using millimeter wave. And then if you have to support ultra low latency type application, you'll be doing edge computing. And then you have the core network where you have a user plane, control plane, and data plane. Uh, you will have connectivity to Wi-Fi. We often uh, move between Wi-Fi and uh, 5G network. Uh, you'll be doing voice over IP type, voice over new radio, uh, IP multimedia subsystem. Here you have the connectivity to the whole internet. And then you may be roaming around, right? So, and there are so many different interfaces. This is all service-based architecture as um, Dr. Ganwal, you said the API, right? That's an important thing. You're exposing the HTTP to uh, JSON type API. So it is so important to understand that. So once you have a complete end-to-end -end picture, what you do, you overlay the potential type of threats that might come. So it might come from my hand devices, right? That means if you are doing supply chain, an operator is trying to provide you know, any kind of phone, you have to make sure what kind of issues that might have there. Uh, things may go over the air, the jamming, denial of service by jamming. Uh, you have the G-Node-Bs, attacks from the physical access to G-Node-B or management interface. Then when you're sending that traffic from G-Node-B to edge cloud or core, um, so that is the data in the transit. So man in the middle attack or eavesdropping, that could happen there too. Then you have these edge clouds, which are getting virtualized. That means the virtualization attacks by third party virtual network functions or site channel attacks. That's something you have to think about. Uh, attacks from the Wi Fi networks, too, right? There have been a lot of interesting studies what's happening on the Wi Fi side if you coexist, right? You go to a Starbucks and come out, you switch back and forth. So attacks may come from there. There are insider attacks. This is very, very uh, troublesome, right? How do you make sure uh, the system locks are in place and nobody is really snooping the data and taking it out? Then uh, with automation, we're talking about AI, ML, automation, and orchestration. Uh, these are the additional enablers for 5G. How can you, uh, if you see an attack, how quickly you detect and mitigate that? How quickly you can instantiate new additional functions to scale up and scale down? Uh, you have the SDN controller. I'll give an example of that. How quickly you can service and different security functions and take care of the attacks, right? Uh, and then uh, you have attacks from the internet side. So people have firewalls, but sometimes they're not properly configured, or sometimes there is misconfiguration. And sometimes maybe there's a malicious attempt by the supplier. Uh, so we get to take care of that too. And then roaming providers, right? If I'm in the United States, now I go to um, India, I connect to a different operator, uh, you know, through, through that, some, you know, things may have, bad things may happen, right? Uh, so that you have to take care of. So once you, once you look at this, you come up with kind of a threat taxonomy, and I, I don't have time to talk about threat taxonomy, but you look at the potential attacks, then uh, you see the causes, and I'll give some example of that, and then you figure out what are the uh, supply chain issues there. So in this case, I'm showing a key pillars of 5G and beyond security. Obviously, today's focus is supply chain, uh, but when we have to look into the security issues that come with 5G, there are opportunities that are also challenges. You know, for example, you are doing edge cloud that offers opportunities uh, or cloud RAN or software defined networking, open source API, uh, network slicing, uh, provide priority service, virtualization, orchestration, etc. cetera. Uh, we need to understand that, but at the same time, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that come up uh, with it. For example, if you're doing SDN, you have flexibility you can, your network can be resilient, but there are problems uh, with the security, right? Uh, so this is how we make a systematic approach uh, to look at end-to-end -end and then how supply chain can be overlaid. Uh, let's look at that. I have something like predictive security. And since we talked about AIML, um, how can you make sure uh, you can detect the 
you can you can predict the attack is going to happen, right? And that's where you really can take advantage of AI ML, look at the uh, predictive or behavioral pattern of the traffic that has happened before. And look, and based on that, you can predict that the attack is going to happen and you completely stop the attack before happening, right? Uh, the other thing, important thing you need to consider is the risk factor, because when you invest uh, in this uh, process, right, you have a likelihood of the vulnerability, which is likelihood is a function of vulnerability, exposure threats and mitigating controls, right? So you need to take a look at what kind of control you have, uh, what are the potential from, uh, probability of vulnerability, and with that, then what is the impact is going to make? Then you have a risk factor, and NIST has a very interesting uh, study on that. So you need to take into account that part. Then you decide your, uh, uh, you know, uh, actual uh, mode of operation. So I'll give some uh, interesting example. Uh, some of like Cloud RAN, for example. What is Cloud RAN? The Open RAN Alliance. This is a big thing where you don't have to depend on a specific operator's uh, architecture. Is open spec, and they are isolating your uh, remote radio head, which are the cell towers, and everything else is going into the cloud, right? So. If, if you're looking into the supply chain and you're trying to see what are the things you're going to put in, you really have to worry about what's happening here. You have all the um, uh, uh, central unit, distribution unit, uh, virtual network functions, you have hypervisors. So what are the potential risks here? What, what are you buying from different operator, right? I mean, different vendor. Uh, similarly, on the remote radio head. So that is one example. So once you know that, then you look at the opportunities that I talked about, right? So if you have... If you are doing open RAN, uh, can I take advantage of some of the open RAN components that will give me security opportunities? That means uh, my programmability, uh, embedding the DDoS detection, mitigation stuff, dynamic radio resource scheduling. So these are the opportunities that I can take care of or take advantage of. At the same time, I have some security challenges, and that's where the supply chain comes in, right? If if I enumerate the security challenges and I know what are the potential mitigation techniques. Then when I procure uh, things uh, for the open RAN on the RAN side, I pay proper attention to that. And this is where you come up with the risk severity and threat likelihood. So that is the cloud RAN. The second component is uh, mobile edge cloud. So as I said, mobile edge cloud, you do that because to support ultra low latency application, right? From you know few milliseconds. So that means you probably have to fo focus a lot of attention, all the security issues that come with edge cloud. Right, and and in do a similar, you know, here here I am showing different types of uh, users like first responder uh, or you know uh, police, EMS, etc. Depending on what kind of application you're using, right? So once you do that, then you do the similar uh, analysis here. You look at the opportunities that you can take advantage of. But the important part is the challenges, right? If if you what are the challenges if I want to do ultra low latency? So what I'm trying to show here is you go. Uh, different parts of the network and apply that to uh, the enablers and what are the advantages you are getting and then when you really get the components you have to look at all the potential mitigation techniques and disability so that is the mobile cloud um, similarly you can do with slicing network slicing is an important thing where uh, you can assign resources end to end and assign the priority right let's say you have a mission critical application, you assign different types of resources, memory, CPU, bandwidth from end to end, and you can dynamically uh, adjust that. Uh, so this is just another example of lack of time. I won't go detail into that, but this is where also you have to see potential attacks that might happen, side channel attacks, impersonation attacks, uh, ceiling between UEs. The fact that I'm pointing out here is we need to have a process to uh, detect this kind of attack or predict that, and then take action on that, right? So that's three examples I gave. Uh, I'll give talk a little bit about API. Um, I think my previous speaker talked about it. It is so, so important. Uh, uh, we are getting into service-oriented, service-based architecture, and people have started using lots of lots of open source. And if you see here, many of the operators, when I used to be in AT&T, uh, we also started using lots of open uh, source component, like orchestration, uh, open RAN, uh, 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 open stack, there are different kinds of things happening. So there are potential problems there. So we need to be careful about when we deploy any kind of uh, components, whether they're using open source, that we have to vet them properly, um, sanitize them before they actually uh, deploy, right? So that's another important thing. 
This is the one I was talking about, put everything together. Um, when, how can you use AI ML type techniques here? So what I am showing here is a closed loop automation. You have a data analytics, you have an orchestration SDN controller, and here you have different types of security function, right? Uh, denial of service, uh, uh, intrusion detection system, and IPS. And here, if attack is coming or about to happen, if it, is, it can be reactive, so how quickly I detect and mitigate the attack. And the other thing could be predictive. That means uh, if I see a certain behavioral pattern happening, I can use AI ML technique to determine something has happened and do you know any kind of data mining. And I stop that attack completely. So here I am showing an example of that, how you can put all the automation data analytics as the controller AI ML technique to predict that something is going to happen and, 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 and stop it, right? This is just, just an example of that. So what is happening? You know, then you look at the ecosystem of different vendors. And this is something uh, CSIS from uh, United States, Washington, DC. He, they have done a pretty interesting study. Uh, so you kind of do a scan of uh, different vendors. As I said, now you understand the user equipment, radio access network, core network, right? So there are different components of the end-to-end uh, -end network. And if you, if you do a survey, this is a little bit outdated, but you know there are companies in the United States, Europe, and in Asia, uh, they have different market penetration. So when we buy these components from them, we have to have certain best current practice before we actually deploy, right? So it is important. And not only that, you have antenna, you have chips, small set chipset. Uh, you know, these are the different things you need to worry about. And again, this is just a overall snapshot of what different companies are doing. But the important part is when operators go and buy these, uh, we need to have a uh, something uh, in, in uh, best current practice. So what people have done, uh, this is again criteria for security and trust in telecommunication networks, uh, CSIS working group. So these are various factors. I have the slides uh, in the back of slides if people want to see more details about that, you can take a look. So these are the factors that one need to uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, political governance criteria, like trustworthiness of the suppliers. Uh, suppliers do not engage in any predatory nature of trade practice. Uh, acquisition process should not be uh, only environmental standard of human rights, etc. Then business practice, uh, whether they have demonstrated any adherence, observation of accounting, uh, whether they're financed openly and transparently, uh, best practice in procurement, right? And then uh, cybersecurity risk mitigation criteria. Uh, so these are the things I talked about, whether they're following 3GPP standards, uh, whether they have done, um, uh, you know, third party assessment, um, the, the, they should be designed and built and maintained according to international standards like 3GPP or ITF or IEEE. Uh, the supplier has a record of addressing remediating security flaws, right? So these are some of the factors we have to take into account. And uh, then uh, the government action to increase confidence in choosing a supplier. Uh, so this is where not only government, the operators should have proper policy and legal tools, and they should work in conjunction with government to make sure uh, the tools are there before they're deployed. Even after they're deployed, they have to be constantly monitoring, right? So these are important things. So in order to really uh, do a good job, it is important to uh, look at different standards. You know, I have listed some of those, uh, but most of these are the open source standards. Uh, 3GPP, uh, ITF, IEEE, uh, you know, there are lots of regulatory uh, bodies as well. Uh, so supply chain cannot just do things by itself. Uh, we have to keep a close connection with the standards, what's happening, participate in some of the proof of concept, etc., uh, and then give the feedback back to the standards so that they actually update the standards to put proper uh, you know, best current practice. Um, I said a little bit about AI ML because, uh, you know, how can I take advantage of uh, the AI ML? So uh, we have a working group AI ML within IEEE Future Network Initiative. We're looking at two things. One is how can I, how can I use AI ML to improve the security posture or security problems? The second thing is there are inherent security problems with AI ML too, right? So things like false positive, uh, th uh, there is no problem, but we somehow AI ML uh, may be hacked, right? Things like that. So it is important to see how we can take advantage of uh, AI ML to prevent or augment the security controls, right? I just, you know, talk about that. And there are uh, attacks, adversaries, data sets. These are important things. Uh, MITRE has uh, this attack matrix for enterprise. Uh, you need to have 
access to lots and lots of data sets. If you really want to do proactively figure out what is going to be attacked, how you can detect that. Uh, so there are so there is an interesting uh, it's an interesting tool. And uh, once you make an assessment, find out what are the potential threats, then you see what kind of AI ML technique you can use uh, to take care of that. Right. Um, some of the key points, I, I think I just have maybe two slides. Uh, so key points of 5G adoption and UJ. So uh, I, I think I mostly focused on supply chain security today, but overall, uh, we uh, they kind of go hand in hand, right? Uh, so when you're talking about supply chain security, you have to look at all the other things that might affect, you know, things like spectrum sharing, uh, densification of cells, because you're going to have lots of lots of this G or D. Uh, RF issues, you know, jamming, things like that. Complexity, you have um, orchestration, automation, microservices, open source, right? So these are all going to affect how you design your supply chain security. And we didn't talk about cultural barriers. Uh, I don't know whether this is going to affect uh, supply chain. There are things like radiation, uh, those things people are still studying. And then policy barriers, obviously supply chain issues come within that. And finally, the spectrum, right? Dynamic spectrum sharing. Many of the operators are using it, whether that will be a factor determining your supply chain. Uh, same summary. Uh, uh, once before that, I want to show you one thing. Yeah. So there is another thing uh, in the IEEE. I talked about that. If you, we have about 15 different working groups. Uh, in fact, the 5G World Forum, uh, it was supposed to be in Bangalore, uh, but we had to do it virtual. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of my colleagues from IEEE from India, they have been participating in this. There are 15 different working groups. If you want to go and take a look, like futurenetworks.ieee.org, um, you know, take advantage of any of the working groups you like to join. We have a deployment working group, security, application, um, edge automation, millimeter web, hardware, et cetera, right? If you see here roadmap, you can go and, you know, contribute there if you like and get to know what's going on. So. So, so in summary, what I was trying to say, and we can have later on discussion, uh, five, I took an example of 5G because uh, it is being deployed and supply chain is very important. People are very uh, worried about the security issues. So I try to give you an a end-to-end view of the security threats that might happen in a 5G network. You open it up, right? So, and you, you, there are opportunities there, but there are challenges. I just gave some example of that. So you need a systematic approach to a threat analysis. I look at your security controls, I look at the risk factor, and then uh, you, uh, you know, implement some best current practice to augment the security controls. Uh, so I gave some example of supply chain security, how you have to take a look at the ecosystem, what vendors are doing, are they following this current practice? And then can you take advantage of AI ML to predict the security problems and uh, take the corrective action? Uh, the finally, collaboration is important. The uh, conferences like this are so important to bring the operators, vendors, researchers, uh, regulators to a common platform to understand and, and, and discuss this. So with that, I end. So this is an interesting time. So uh, innovation revolution and supply chain is becoming more and more complex and network gets more complex. Uh, with that, I will end. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Datta. Thank you. I think that was a very interesting presentation. and. In the context of our discussion, I think that throws up some real, really intriguing questions. Uh, you touched upon points like, say, security challenges, especially related to 5G networks. And th those are certain questions, I think, which when we talk about the benefits that AI ML technology bring to procurement, we should also be looking at what are the kind of challenges that such security issues throw up for the digital marketplaces of the future. Absolutely. I think we'll be delving... We, we will be delving more on these issues. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, Madam Elisa from the European Bank of for Reconstruction and Development. Maybe she would like to please share her views. Over to you, Madam. I think there are certain uh, connectivity issues. In that case, I would like to invite Mr. my colleague, Mr. Mayank Malhotra, uh, from who's a partner at Delight. Uh, over to you, Mayank, for your views, please. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Kanpal. Am I audible clearly? Yes, surely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you, Mr. Datta, for an insightful session on challenges, you know, in network security. Those are important uh, uh, sort of uh, 
uh, milestones that we need to keep in mind while we are implementing ai ml you know technologies for betterment of procurement especially in government context and also in uh, private sector these are equally important given the frequency of attacks etc that we are seeing increasing day by day so thank you so much uh, so i like to you know start uh, with a video and i would request the it team to kind of play a video it talks about uh, the challenges that cpos face day to day and what they can do what are the levers available with cpos uh, you know that uh, they can utilize to make procurement more efficient more uh, value adding uh, function for the organization so we can see the video please to compete on the open road procurement leaders must think beyond the finish line to strategize to drive alignment to build the a team ultimately maximizing efficiency while delivering optimal performance by forming a procurement leadership council to align stakeholders and provide executive visibility to value extracted from spend through establishing simple category decision rights savings methodologies and standard governance tools and forms to reinforce accountability the journey requires a road map a point on the horizon reached by leveraging advanced category strategies to triple historical savings by tapping into the category insights solution to get the latest pulse of supply markets harnessing the proliferation of data through advanced modeling tools to better manage supplier fragmentation and specification complexity navigating supply market shifts leveraging the global sourcing insights tool which evaluates total landed costs predicts supply market trends and assesses supplier and country viability a blueprint for success requires a hands-on approach positioning procurement leaders for success through the CPO executive transition lab restructuring the organization to deploy strategic resources against the most valuable sourcing opportunities and gaining more efficiency from transactional activities leveraging robotics building strategic capabilities for ongoing value creation using a robust hands-on 6-day training curriculum Deloitte's proprietary digital tools amplify and accelerate value realization from external spend cognitive spend utilizes artificial intelligence to rapidly classify complex spend data from multiple systems. DICE uses advanced optical character recognition and natural language processing to deliver structured data from unstructured documents like contracts and bills of materials. Design Sight quickly classifies parts data to enable spec rationalization and target costing. creating better visibility to clearly see the road ahead charting the course between business stakeholders and suppliers to unlock more P&L impact increase efficiency and harness innovation from the supply base to rewrite the rules of the road for procurement I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, I'll put up the presentation in the full screen mode. So, if we can just recall the words that we heard in the video, right? So, they talked about uh, visibility for procurement leaders. They talked about innovation, uh, collaboration, and uh, you know, aligning all the stakeholders, increasing efficiency. So, all these terms are nothing new for a CPO, right? Uh, this has been the trend uh, historically also. So. Uh, what deloitte typically does is that every year we do a cpo survey for uh, global leaders in procurement and we reach out to some uh, 500 uh, procurement leaders across uh, 40 countries uh, with leading companies which have a turnover in excess of 5 trillion and we uh, survey with them what are the priorities that they have 
so uh, the slide on the right uh, left side is talking about uh, the the findings uh, of 2019 survey right so almost one and a half years back when we ran the survey we could still see companies or cpos focusing on digital technologies to gain visibility in their supply chain and helping them plan for contingencies uh, cpos were talking about reducing costs managing risks uh, and uh, leveraging digital business models uh, for their companies so all of these were already there and now what has happened is that in the covid-19 pandemic scenario the companies which were already move fast uh, you know forwarding on the digital agenda and uh, 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 were path breaking in this area were actually able to uh, pass this pandemic with a slightly less uh, bruises uh, compared to some other organizations so covid-19 what has done for supply chain is actually accelerated the path of resilience for various supply chains across companies so now if i talk about the pillars of resilience right visibility flexibility of uh, supply chain collaboration and control are now the key pillars which are sort of uh, uh, metrics on which each supply chain is now being measured so uh, the companies should have visibility uh, across their tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 suppliers uh, they should be able to Uh, adapt to the changes uh, that are happening in demand without incurring too much of additional operating costs so if i have to change my logistics mode i should be able to shift around uh, quickly uh, i should have backup suppliers available if one supplier is you know in a pandemic struck an area he is not able to supply there should be alternate sources of supply so that i can shift uh, without incurring too much of additional sourcing costs uh so this offers uh, more visibility flexibility as well as uh, you know opportunity to collaborate across my vendors if i have a collaboration platforms already developed uh, with my vendors i can plan with them what level of inventory they need to maintain what is their stock in hand uh, what is uh, it that i am planning to produce in the near future and hence uh, do they also need to realign their uh, production accordingly so uh, those are the key Uh, i would say pillars on which the resilience of supply chain is now resting and this is something that uh, we saw in the 2020 survey also which we did with the cpos so virtual procurement is now the next uh, normal next reality around 35% of the companies are saying that uh, they will make work from home as a normal practice going forward as well right and what it has done is that it has increased the need for employees to have uh, access to the company systems uh, the digital infrastructure is becoming all the more important in this new normal given that procurement is offering uh, you know working remotely and managing from home uh, so uh, taking those same principles right it is around digitalization around uh, uh, having uh, collaboration and control in the processes and visibility now if we see an interesting finding uh, almost uh, 163 out of fortune 1000 companies have their tier 1 suppliers uh, in wuhan right which was the most impacted uh, region because of covid 19 so it doesn't seem much that only 163 out of 1000 fortune 1000 companies but if i expand the scope to include tier 2 tier 3 and beyond suppliers almost 94% of those uh, 1000 companies fortune 1000 companies have uh, some sort of uh, supply base in wuhan so you can imagine the extent of uh, disruption that it creates and uh, 50% of the cpo surveyed had visibility only up to tier 1 right uh, for tier 2 tier 3 etc people didn't even know where they existed and uh, what was the impact uh, they uh, they were facing of covid 19 pandemic so the organizations which were already ahead on this path of creating uh, visibility they were two times more likely you know in the past to have prioritized digitization in their companies and hence uh, they reap the benefits of those uh, digital interventions and they could sustain better in the pandemic scenario now finally uh, in the hindsight you know all of us are intelligent so now 18% of the cpos uh, review the fact that they were not proactive enough and they had not uh, you know started digitalization of their supply chains uh, earlier so uh, 
what we did also is that uh, we focused on how the government uh, organizations they fared uh, what is the leaders of procurement across government organizations globally how they feel so it's not very different from uh, the private uh, sector uh, around 70% uh, you know 69% of procurement leaders uh, globally in government also feel that cost optimization is one of the biggest uh, focus areas for them they also believe that analytics uh, has you know great potential in future and they need to focus on advanced analytics uh, uh, and allied technologies and we also surveyed what are the analytics techniques right uh, in the next 2 years which people see have great potential and you can see predictive analytics uh, stands out with around 60% of the respondents saying that uh, they will focus on this going future in the future right and then there are obviously point solutions in procurement across sourcing supplier management uh, or end to end platforms like e procurement platform uh, so these are the top 3 i would talk about and specifically if we deep dive into you know government procurement we studied the policy manuals that are published by government year on year and these are some of the keywords which are uh, a word cloud sort of start you know, standing out in those policy documents so you see uh, the focus has been shifting towards analytics uh, e procurement and e bidding and if we look at some of the use cases of ai ml technologies which we can leverage in government procurement or uh, you know procurement otherwise as well uh, there are various uh, machine learning based optimizations for uh, allocating orders and i will talk about this use case uh, in slightly more detail in subsequent slide uh, there are cost reduction opportunities that can be leveraged using uh, artificial intelligence uh, now we all know that uh, pandemic has created a lot of ripples in the market and on a daily basis there are some or the other news items or you know trade wars which uh, trump had initiated with china so how do i make sense of all those uh, news items how is it impacting the market sentiment so there are some natural language processing use cases that can read various news items related to a commodity and uh, given output of how the market sentiment is looking is it bullish bearish neutral sentiment and all of it enables the buyer to take a informed uh, buying judgment buying calls uh let me just uh, deep dive into uh, two use cases uh, what we have done with some of our clients private sector clients so we created a digital application uh, for a conglomerate in india and this application was a sort of a cockpit uh, for the buyer where he could log in on a daily basis at the start of his day and he would get insights on all the important uh, decision that he needs to make so that he can uh, create a uh, value for the company by taking uh, informed buying decisions uh, this platform was built entirely on cloud and it was uh, taking inputs from internal structured data sources like erp as well as from uh, some external sources uh, like i said news websites uh, unstructured data sources and some other uh, uh, websites which were giving uh, information about the commodities that the procurement team was dealing in now how we did uh, this was that we uh, mapped the entire day in the life of buyer identified what are the important moments that matter the key decisions that they take uh, during the day and what we can do through artificial intelligence or machine learning to make that decision making process more uh, intuitive for the buyer a prescriptive uh, buying process for him so uh, to talk about two use cases here uh, this conglomerate was buying natural rubber and it accounted for around 15% of their spend so uh, they needed uh, information on when they should buy rubber when the prices are you know going to bottom out and how much quantity they should buy from which supplier they should be buying it so we built a machine learning uh, based uh, algorithm a model deep learning model which could look at around 45 to 50 factors across demand supply you no know, import export or exchange rates etc and also look at the interplay of those factors how they have impacted rubber prices in the past we could also pull in the news items as i mentioned earlier and how that market sentiment uh, was impacting rubber prices and through this machine learning model we were able to tell the buyer what is the likely you know pricing going to be in one week from now uh, next seven days one month and so on so the buyer could uh, try to time the market and uh, they were able to achieve around 1% savings uh, on their spend 
using this machine learning uh, based recommendations another interesting use case was that uh, the buyers uh, spent around 5 to 10 uh, days a month actually allocating orders to their vendors because there were so many vendors and uh, there were some constraints that they had to meet uh, for orders to be allocated to those vendors so they built a linear optimization order allocation engine which could look at historical performance of the vendor could look at what are the uh, constraints that need to be met and hence uh, uh, taking all this minimize the overall cost that was the ultimate objective function to minimize the overall cost for the company and at a click of a button it could give a recommended order uh, you know summary sheet uh, across vendors so using this we were able to uh, unlock a lot of uh, efficiency and a lot of value for the client the second case that i want to talk about is uh, for a multinational so earlier one was an indian conglomerate this was for a multinational client it's a consumer product packaged goods company uh, and uh, they wanted a complete transformation of their procurement function using digital technologies to achieve twin objectives the first objective was to release uh, 30 to 40% efficiency for their buyers and transform from being a more operationally heavy a uh, company to a more value focused organization so if you look at the left side of this chart right uh, these are sort of various uh, functions within procurement so to say sub functions within procurement uh, which the buyers were doing so if you look at data analytics uh, and the uh, height of the bar is total number of hours that the team is uh, spending right so around 15 to 20% time you could see being spent on data analytics the next three uh in the green color are you know payments uh, helping suppliers uh, getting their payments on time resolving blocked invoices or tracking you know deliveries where my orders are is there going to be a delay in the order do i need to look for a backup plan are the contracts uh, you know going to expire soon uh, and then working on creating new contracts so all of these are operational tasks so if you see a good 30 to 40% of the time was being spent uh, you know on operational tasks and then source to contract which is again a value you know based activity again 15 to 20% time only on source to contract and then supplier life cycle management which is collaborating with the supplier resolving their queries etc is again i think 25% of the time so operationally heavy task and then they had some 4000 skus uh, or items that they were buying and they were building models uh, to forecast price for those 4000 uh, uh, items a very very effort intensive task that the buyers were doing and there was a global team sitting centrally in uh, netherlands and somewhere in europe and uh, running those forecasting models for them so uh, we figured out that uh, one of and the most important kpi for the cpo of this company was that uh, how could he provide a gross margin number to his board and be confident that they will be able to hit that gross margin number by the end of next quarter that was the single most important kpi on which the cpo was being measured and hence the forecasting activity became very very important for them but then it was uh, manual it was uh, done through excel files uh, non standardized across buyers uh, across countries so a lot of uh, time effort being wasted in first generating the forecast and then re- reconciling those forecast at the end of quarter on where they landed up uh, actually so uh, we figured out uh, various digital interventions in order to deliver for example we brought in platforms uh, to collaborate uh, with their suppliers uh, we brought in uh, track and trace tools so that they could look at uh, where their shipments were in real time Uh, on supplier life cycle management the supplier onboarding time as uh, mr kantpal also was saying earlier for this organization it was 5 weeks uh, rather than 5 months but uh, we brought it down to 5 days uh, from 5 weeks uh, through a self service portal that was designed for suppliers uh, and in forecasting a lot of uh, models were automated uh, and they were standardized and a platform again a digital platform was brought in where those models could be built and collaboration could happen between buyers so that uh, you know all of them use single uh, templates for building their models so uh, and in source to contract again we created bottom up uh, costing models uh, for various important items and thus uh, we were able to release almost 50% uh, efficiency in terms of man hours 
and achieve around 15% uh, value savings for the organization. So those were the two cases uh, uh, from my side. I, and I think uh, that's it. I am done. Uh, happy to take on any questions later on. Thank you, Mayank. I think the initial IO41 would be very interested in the CPO survey. Some of the results, some of the findings of the CPO survey that you mentioned. We'll have a lot of sure, things to talk about that later. I would now like to welcome Ms. Elysia Nivia Domska, who would from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, who would be talking on new solution for digital procurement. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry for joining the, the panel slightly late, but this is the usual problem of figuring out the time zone, the place, and the camera functionality. Uh, thank you so much for your kind invitation. I am here uh, today to, to talk to you uh, about the work that I do at EBRD, European Bank for Construction and Development uh, in London. And we happen to work together with uh, two organizations. I hope that you are getting my screen uh, okay. And then you will see that these organizations are the EBRD, which is a development bank that works mainly with the private sector and green economy. United Nations Commission for International Trade Law, Ancetral, and Open Contracting Partnership, a think tank that has been born out of the idea at the World Bank, and it's promoting open data in uh, public uh, procurement. What we have discovered analyzing digital transformation of public procurement, we have discovered a couple of uh, lessons uh, learned uh, from different countries, which we think that they are uh, largely responsible for the challenges that e-procurement reforms are facing. So we have realized that uh, transparency is being recognized as a core principle, but public procurement data, especially machine readable data, is not that available. We have modern procurement laws that say what information has to be published by procuring entities. But that they don't say how to publish and how to make use of this information for procurement process management. Mm -hmm. We have a number of governments investing in e-procurement systems and reforming procurement legislation. But these governments, they frequently suffer from lack of public procurement market data. And if they have this data, this data is not made public for reuse business and for improvement in governance. And finally, we have the challenges reported around e-procurement systems that are simply difficult to use. And this is all what we have noticed uh, working with the uh, various governments in the region. And we have brought it down to two simple questions. Uh, and these are about how much value for money the government wants and how much transparency the government may need. And the transparency is driven by the uh, in international instrument, by legislative framework, uh, but not everyone in the world has subscribed to the World Trade Organization Agreement on Government Procurement Rules. However, we have re realized that more transparency can actually drive more efficiency in the contract. And the observation we have made, it is each government actually has three markets. They have a market of micro-value contracts. And these are considered uh, micro-value because they are frequently not regulated by public procurement rules. And honestly speaking, these contracts, they should be uh, subject to digitalized approach that is allowing full automation, because this is only uh, the way how the government can relieve administration from the burden of administrative tasks related to these contracts. Because the, the fact that public procurement law does apply doesn't mean that uh, they are not subject to transparency and competition requirements. Then we have a market of uh, low-value contracts which are not of interest for international trade. 
So WTO, you will not find it there. But these are the contracts which normally uh, contribute percent of the market. And they are these contracts which administration is dealing with every day. And then you have the top of the market, which is the high value contracts that are of interest for international trade. And these contracts are frequently well regulated and well provided for with the digital tools. But as you can see, they are just the top of the iceberg. And we have checked Ukraine. And in Ukraine, micro value contracts, they constitute 60% of government budget. You have another 20% in low value and then another in the high value contracts, which was a message that actually digital procurement has to develop taking into account a need for right tool, for right type of contract, for different markets, for different business culture, for can be big and small, and for uh, suppliers that can be big and small. And if we don't have it all put into account, the digital system will not be efficient. And we were looking at this in particular when uh, COVID lockdowns made governments realize that e-procurement systems that were considered luxury items, they are today a necessity to maintain the supply chain for the public services necessary for the government. And within this, uh, we have formulated three, three lessons that we learned from practice and we apply in practice on our pilot projects. And we have put together the, the thing that is frequently separated, which is the policy reform agenda, digitalization agenda, and open uh, data agendas. They have to be unit, united in the procurement case because only then the procurement process, which is horizontal across the government, can bring the efficiency gains for, for the government uh, itself. We have worked with open contracting data standard because standardizing public procurement data and creating a single platform of data sharing, comparison and exchange electronically is making possible uh, any type of analytical exercise, but is also making possible to progress digitalization to the different level. And finally, we have learned to talk to open government enthusiasts who are telling us that a feedback loop from stakeholder, so the feedback loop from suppliers and feedback loop from buyers makes a difference when captured digitally. And what we would like to, to share with you today is basically an understanding that is perhaps quite difficult for lawyers, uh, but it is very pragmatic. When we have a need to digitally transform public procurement process, we have to accept that we deal with different markets we, need, we, we deal with buyers which may not have the complete knowledge of uh, procurement rules, but they can work with digital workflow that guides their decision. And this is making, in practice, quick wins for the government. Time to market, better buyer satisfaction, and also steep change in compliance and better performance of procurement contracting authorities. And if you would ask us what we tried to test, I have prepared for you a list which is borrowed from the recent study, but we tried it in practice. So, at procurement process from pre-tendering through tenders and post-tendering part up to the policy enforcement, we have checked what type of innovative emerging technologies can be used to support this process. And as you see, for the planning and analysis, we start from business um, intelligence and we got to go to big data and analytics. And you see here automation and machine learning. The same automation is super important for preparation part because it simply saves time and saves transaction cost for both contracting entities and suppliers. And the wider, perhaps, implementation of new technologies, so not only automation, um, not only machine learning, but also artificial intelligence 
applications, they can be found in the tendering part when they can support qualification. They can support different evaluation methodologies and they can support different procurement methods depending whether we want to have a fully automated quick purchasing online shopping for micro contracts. Uh, we work with uh, low value contracts but on a wide range across uh, regional government or whether we have a very sophisticated procurement process for the new airport or the new uh, lighting system for the municipality. And here uh, we have tested these uh, different technologies on a bunch of pilots in Ukraine and in Moldova. And I'm talking about Ukraine and Moldova because their governments, they have uh, been interested in technological leapfrogging and they agreed to work with the bank on lab projects. And these lab projects, they are using automation to simplify qualification of suppliers and simplify the evaluation. So evaluation can be completed totally without evaluation panel engagement, but can this way achieve the full compliance, which is built in into the evaluation process and time gains, which are immense when you consider the procedure in question. So here, as an example, I can share with you a, a, a couple of projects which were using uh, automate, uh, automation uh, in practice, uh, which is the online shopping for Prozoro Market. This is uh, energy efficiency contracts where we have digitalized and automated the entire evaluation process. So it's completed fully on the system. It saves time and effort for the municipalities which are buying modern uh, energy saving contracts. And we have been working with business intelligence for Prozoro, which today's, today helps to not only draw from a vast amount of information in one standard data format and available to everyone online, but also allows to run predictive pricing, allow pre-qualification of suppliers based on their previous experience that is reported to the system, and finally, uh, we have a machine learning pilot, which is allowing us to support national um, ex ante monitoring unit with identifying uh, collusion cases and identifying non-compliant cases. And we are working on e-audit of public procurement with Kyrgyz public procurement unit in the National Audit Office to replace auditors working with documents to auditors working with data. And these are the cases we are most proud of. Uh, I, I'm happy to share more information if of interest. But looking at the contract management, this is perhaps the area where new technologies are most useful. And what we have uh, promoted to the government is not only to look at the technology supporting receipt of products or services, performance management, but also to look at the technology that is sup uh, supporting core government function, compliance review, audit, monitoring, and financial control. And these cases we have implemented working with Moldovan government. But how we place it in terms of uh, digital systems development? I think what COVID made us realize it is that we have quickly uh, gain the understanding that we are no longer happy with just publication or online interaction or even online contracts. The governments want now to have end-to-end -end digital process, which is highly automated, that is implementing compliance check in the uh, process by default and allows procurement officers to focus on the market uh, experience and market research through new data-driven analytical products. We are working with this particular using the distributed architecture systems because we do believe with multi-platform markets. 
And these uh, pilots that we run, they are designed to be open. And to have this design open, we are using three technological concepts. Uh, we use uh, business process modeling notations for self-executable processes for the new digital systems. We work with open contracting data standard to have data available from various systems in the same format that is machine readable and reusable. And we work with various uh, API technologies to facilitate integration through OCDS. So we use OCDS essentially to unlock the data from IT systems to make the, the, the system more interoperable and provide uh, data for uh, decision making. Uh, those of you interested in how open contracting data standard works, I need to ask you to check open contracting uh, partnership website where you will have more information. But what you should hear from me it is that this data format allows to build an end-to-end -end digital procurement process across various systems because we cannot imagine that every time we will be able to work on the national level with one system that serves all and everyone is happy. But we can have one source of data for all users. And this data can be aggregated automatically and online from a number of e-procurement systems using OCDS data format. How this is being done? This is through different scenarios that I'm going to spare you because it sounds horribly boring, at least for us lawyers. But depending on the system technology, capacity, you can work with OCDS data anyway because OCDS API exports, they are totally neutral regarding the e-procurement system technology. So the message is the government can have it on e-procurement system they operate. How we used the... Um, uh, approach, we use it for integration. So no matter how many portals the government has, they can be all aligned into a single workflow for users. And this is perhaps the biggest gain we have observed. And finally, we looked at enforcement. And what is the benefit of putting all public procurement market data in one place? It is that it opens doors to various analytical but also business technologies that help to deliver the process, that help to build, build new data-driven products, but also uh, a fact that they allow the citizens to understand government spending decisions better, which makes the ex-ante automated monitoring and e-audit uh, more trustworthy for the standard citizen when the citizens are aware that this is being done by a robot working on data and this robot treats everyone the same. So there is no preferences, no discrimination. And the, a bunch of examples that turned important in particular with uh, COVID era, it is the digital tools for engaging with market, with civil society, and with um, business. These are the tools uh, built around uh, preventing corruption. So whistleblowing systems, red flag monitoring systems, but also various BI uh, tools that are bringing towards suppliers, the market monitoring, and the stuff that I have already mentioned. So core government function put on the data, ex-ante monitoring, audit. So what we see as a, uh, an outcome of the crisis for new digital solutions, it is that this is the question of how the governments will look at procurement policy differently and how the governments will look at digital systems differently. They will look at them from the point of defining performance standards. And if we have enough data within the public procurement markets, you can measure the performance, improve the process, and report it. And this is perhaps something that I want to leave with you uh, as a key message from this presentation, which is uh, about how 
automated evaluation, how automated preselections, how automated contract management is driving the efficiency on the transaction level, is improving the transparency because if you have automated workflow and it res re responds to transparency requirements in the law, you have this compliance by default, but it also drives the performance from the market and allows procurement people to continue innovate in new ways of doing a public procurement process as such. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you. And I think a very useful context setting you have done as to how governments, economies across the world look at digital procurement in their respective domains. Uh, I particularly like the initial point that you made that transparency is a key principle recognized in public procurement, but very few. Uh, but public procurement data is not often made public. Uh, a very important point you've raised there and uh, in the context of uh, government e marketplace which is the agent, which is a digital marketplace established by um, the government of india i would just like to tell that we have a system whereby we have provided all the data which is which pertains to all the tenders happening on the platform we have made it completely there of anybody any researcher any student can visit and it can uh, they can come and have the data and we also encourage people researching on this data and providing us with their findings. Just a point that I thought I should uh, make in passing. Another very important issue that uh, you, I'm glad you touched upon is the training issues related to buyers in uh, e-procurement. Our country experience has been that this is uh, the capacity building component to this whole aspect is very important and is often understated to the extent that um, some very important projects, they do not build this component in. So thank you. I think some very important points raised. Uh, uh, so we will now, we have uh, some more time left. I think we will be taking some questions. So I have been shown some questions on my panel. I think Mr. Datta, uh, there is a question for you. What types of emerging technologies are available to support automated assessment of suppliers or bid evaluation? And what are the key factors for a buyer to decide on what is the most appropriate technology to use? Maybe you would like to answer that? Yeah, Let's sure. That. Uh, sure, Dr. Kanpal. And it was great to listen to Lija and Mayank. Uh, really great insight. Uh, well, I'm a technologist. I focus mostly on the network side. Uh, but it's good to see how the supply chain, um, and I focus on the 5G and, and security aspects. Um, so what I can uh, say here, um, if, if you really, if, if you really want to take a look at the network, and then there's a question about automation, how can you overlap some of the tools once you understand uh, the supply chain security risks, right? Uh, so there has to be some of the tools that was uh, given by the previous speakers, plus some of the things I talked about. So the tools I talked about allows you to figure out the potential threats in the network, right? Having things like uh, open network automation platform on app, um, uh, any kind of orchestration tool, uh, or um, having the ability to detect potential uh, traps or attacks in the network, uh, then you can take that information and apply to the tools that were discussed in the previous two talks to figure out how to mitigate that, right? On how to take action to make sure your supply chain um, is properly secure. I think I should put it that way. I, I don't think I talked about uh, the, the tools that will help you to make the supply chain smooth enough, but I talked about mostly how to detect the potential attacks, then use that as an input to the tools that was provided by the previous two speakers. Uh, I'll put it that way. Um, I guess I guess it is important not to just depend on one specific tool. You look at the techniques that are available, and it's almost like a dependency, right? You, you and, and depending on which vertical you're looking at. I gave an example of 5G network. You look at agriculture. You look at uh, e-health. Uh, look at public safety. Things may look different, right? So you have to kind of take case by case basis. I should say. Uh, Mr. Kanpal, if I can, I also add. Yeah, sure, sure. 
Go ahead. Sure. I would. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Lisa, you Please can go ahead. Can also go ahead. Uh, after you, uh, well, what I wanted to, to highlight, I wanted to highlight that we are frequently looking at the technology aspect without the context. And for me, it was uh, an amazing uh, learning experience to, to, uh, to realize that actually we need a bunch of technologies that we use to create a modern system. When we started to talk to prototyping lab to build automated prequalification, uh, they told me, yes, you know, actually the policy model is on the market since European Union published European uh, single procurement document and you have everything there, but no one has ever implemented now even domestically across border because it does require a data standard. And my answer was, but we have a data standard. We can use OCDS and can you just please build the prototype? And this is exactly what they did. They used, they used OCDS data standard to bring together the technical requirements on the uh, qualification of suppliers. And they used robotic process automation to uh, make the process cross-border effectively executed. And they have used business process modeling to ensure that process as designed by lawyers is exactly the same process because it's a self-executable technology in the system. And I was just, I couldn't believe my eyes, okay? When they put in front of us, uh, us a prototype that allows me as a contracting authority to configure my requirements that links this configuration through the OCDS data standard to various digital registers which are holding supplier data and holds this data for automated pre-qualification and eligibility check. And if I need evaluation panel, I can plug it in at the later stage to run this part, which is not fully ready for automation. While my IT guys, they tell me that from the data modeling point of view and, uh, and technology point of view, you can have it fully automated. So now we are facing an idea how to build uh, a fully automated pre-qualification process for a concession project in Ukraine, where we will use the OCBS data standard to link uh, different registers, to use legal entity identifier to confirm um, uh, the authentic uh, user participation, and that we will use automation, some robotic robotics as well, speed up the qualification. Because when I was first told that pre-qualification questionnaire for a concession project, this is 1,500 questions. Which supplier wants to produce it on paper and wants to go to Ukraine and wants to participate in a concession project? It has to be put on a data level that supplier can feed his required documents or link uh, to the relevant public register where the supplier is registered as a company and we can run these 1,500 questions automatically, which takes, I'm sorry, 30 minutes, not two weeks of work and a lot of money spent on a tendering team in the supplier department. So this is what, what we have learned uh, on the policy side. And this is the, the practical experience that you have to reconsider the way how you use technology, how you use data standards, who are approaching the process itself in the government, whether the government is ready to go digital. Because in my case, the biggest part of the digital transformation uh, change management is to make people in the government believe that automated process will deliver transparency by default plus will be easy to use. And our definition of easy to use, it, it is two hours training per user to make you uh, use micro-purchasing online shopping. And I have done it in Tunisia, which started to do e-procurement three years ago. And we realized that, yes, if you will simplify the user interface of the government system, the same way as commercial uh, companies do to attract people to Facebook, Instagram, and so on, 
they will do it easily and the cost of training is minimal. So yes, we have learned the lesson. Thank you, Elisa. Maya, perhaps you wanted to add something. Yeah, just one point, I think uh, uh, this has to be very, very specific to each organization, right? What are the parameters on which they want to assess their suppliers? Is it uh, financial metrics around the supplier? Is it operational metrics like uh, what is the size of factory, etc.? So there are various tools, right, and technologies which have emerged where uh, you can uh, do a social media listening and sensing of information around suppliers, what others are saying uh, about that supplier or that company. Mm -hmm. uh, there are tools through which you can pull in the financial data, uh, you know, either published uh, or if it's an unlisted company, uh, even, um, even then they have to publish their financials with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, right? So all of that can be automated uh, and the rules can be defined on... Uh, revenue growth or profitability, et cetera. So uh, that, that is very much possible. There are tools and technologies available that can do that. Even virtual inspection of their facilities, uh, uh, remote assessment, all of that is also possible. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I think uh, we have already overshot our time. So I think this has been a very engaging discussion. Thank you so much. I would like to thank my colleagues Ashutosh, Mayank and Eliza for this intensely engaging discussion that we had. Uh, for me personally, I've taken a lot of notes. My, my notes are there. I'm going to take them back to office. Lots of new ideas here. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank the audience uh, uh, for throwing up the questions. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. With thank that, you. we can close this session. Thanks. Thank you, thank you everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank Good you. day. Bye. Bye. Many thanks. Thank Many thanks to our wonderful session chair, Dr. Kanpal, all the speakers, Mr. Merotra, Eliza, Mr. Ashutosh Datta for joining us and enlightening us on the theme. Thanks a lot. With this, Thank we come so to much. an end of today's uh, proceeding.